Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, you can look on with someone close to you or one will be provided for you. Romans chapter 12. And uh, I'm going to continue on in what I was, uh, this is our Sunday school hour. I guess, would that be correct, Brother uh, Payne? <laughs> well, you've got me scheduled three times today, so I need to divide things up, I'm assuming. Whatever, you would like. Whatever I would like it to be. Okay, let's see here. And we'll just go from Sunday school. How does that sound? And, and I'll teach you from what I've been preaching from for the week about the pictures that Paul paints for us in Romans uh, chapter 12. And I'll review just a little bit, and then I will give you some brand new material today. And uh, Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 14, will you remain seated while I read, uh, if you would just listen very carefully. Romans 12, beginning in verse 14. The Bible says, Bless them which persecute you, and bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense no man evil for evil, Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Father, help us now to have an understanding of Scripture. The psalmist wrote, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. So, Lord, if the psalmist was right, and he was, the key to obedience is understanding. So help us to understand today. In Jesus' name, amen. By way of a quick review, looking over what I've covered over the last three messages that I've preached, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And remember what the mercies of God were? They were chapters 1 through 11 in Romans. In Romans 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul goes through painstaking detail of what God did to bring salvation to us. I mean, he goes through detail after detail after detail after detail of what God did to make it possible for us to come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And he goes to the, he said that we took the gospel to the Jew first, but the Jews rejected it. So God took it to the Gentiles so that the Gentile people could be saved. And if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. That's what, that's what all of us are. And the only reason you and I can know Jesus today is because of that blunder that happened with the Jews. They did not want to hear about Jesus, and so therefore the gospel was brought to us. So Paul says, <clears throat> I beseech you therefore, brethren, speaking to these Jewish people that had gotten saved, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by those mercies in Romans 1 through 11, he says, now it's time for you to present your body as a living sacrifice unto God. And he says, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So he says, the only reasonable thing to do, the only logical thing to do, seeing everything that God has done for you to save you, is for you to give yourself back to the Lord. It only makes good sense. That's the best way to thank him, is to say, okay, you can have all of me, not part of me, but you can have all of me. That has nothing to do with salvation, has nothing to do with going to heaven. It has everything to do with whether or not you're going to dedicate your life to the Lord. But then he gives us instruction of how to give ourselves to the Lord. He says, holy. 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so he says here that we are seed as a sacrifice on the altar. That's the first picture that Paul draws, is a sacrifice on the altar. But then he takes us from that sacrifice to a second picture, and that was a member of the body. And he was speaking of the local church, not the uh, big church that will one day exist in heaven, uh, certainly not the body of all believers, as many believe it is today. He was talking about the local body of Christ that has a, a head, which is Jesus Christ, uh, the local body of Christ, which has uh, many, um, many members, and each member has a function, just like my body has a head and eyes and ears and hands and arms and legs and feet. Every portion of my body has a function that makes the body function properly. And people within a local church, each of them have a particular ministry that God has given to them. And so Paul said, when you're dedicated to the Lord, every member of the body works properly. Isn't that great? But if you're not dedicated to the Lord, there's going to be a lot of suffering that goes on inside the local church because people are not doing their jobs. Then the third picture that we talked about last night was that he draws a picture that we are a brother in the family. And as a brother in the family of God, in the family of our local church, we have responsibilities one toward another. One was to love without hypocrisy and to be honest as a business individual and have a good testimony and all of those things. But that's not going to happen if you're not dedicated. That's not going to happen if you're not living the right kind of life. That's not going to happen if you are if not submissive to the Lord. So he makes it very, very clear. All these things go in line. Now, today we're going to come to a... Um, a fourth picture that the Apostle Paul draws. And this is the difficult one. Because within our local churches, not everybody gets along. Am I right? Not everybody gets along with one another. You remember uh, in one church Paul went to, there was a fellow by the name of Alexander the coppersmith. He was a critic. He was mean-tongued. He was a kind of an individual that you did not want to, uh, to lead anything because he had such a bad spirit about him. There is another fellow by the name of Diotrephes. He names him by name and says that Diotrephes was an individual that loved to have the preeminence. In other words, he always wanted to be out in the front and always wanted to be first and wanted all the recognition. And Paul rebuked Diotrephes. You remember in the church at Philippi where the Philippian believers were, there were two women in that church. One of them was named Iodias. The other one was named Syntyche. These two women didn't get along with each other. He said, I beseech Eodius and Syntyche that they be of the same mind. Why did he do that? Because these two women were fighting with each other all the time. And so we do know that anytime you have a group of people, you're going to have disagreements. Anytime you have people that all of them know Jesus. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, Diotrephes knew Jesus. There's no doubt in my mind that Alexander the coppersmith knew Jesus. I don't doubt for one little bit that Theodius or Syntyche uh, knew Jesus. I know that they did, but they were Christians who simply didn't get along with one another. So the fourth picture that we're going to see here, <laughs> and it almost sounds like it doesn't fit, but it does, and that's a soldier in the battle. That's a soldier in the battle. First of all, a sacrifice on the altar. Secondly, a member of the body. Thirdly, a brother in the family. But lastly, a soldier in the battle. And the verses that we read talk about how there are those. And I want you to see this. Do you see uh, verse 20? This is where I get this from. It says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger. So here you are, a soldier in the battle. You know, not everybody's going to agree with you on every little thing. You take two independent, fundamental, God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians and put them in the same room, they're going to come up with something that they disagree on. They're gonna, now, I know of one exception to that. In all my years as a Christian, I know of one exception to that, maybe two, but I know of one. I had a meeting a long time ago with my staff at my church, and there was a problem that had arisen, and we had an Eodius and a Syntyche that were not getting along with one another. And I felt bad about it, so I had to meet with everybody. And I said, now I know there are areas where Brother Penn and I disagree. And I said the same thing I said to you. 
You can't put two people in the same room without having a disagreement over something. I said, so I know there's an area where Brother Penn and I disagree. But I said, he's never expressed it to me, and I have no idea what it is. So I had my meeting, fixed the problem. We went on our way. Brother Penn came up to me later on. He goes, uh, I don't know if you've ever watched Columbo on TV. <laughs> and he, uh, uh, I, uh, I got another question that I want to ask you, you know. And uh, Brother Penn says, uh, preacher, um, I've been, he said, I've been thinking about what you said, about there being an area where you and I disagree. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I can't think of one. He said, I don't know of a single area where you and I have a disagreement. I thought, wow, am I blessed. That was incredible. But on average, in any church, you're going to have people that don't get along with each other. There are going to be those who judge others, are critical of others, they're critical of how they dress, how they speak, how they act, how they smell, how they talk, how they sing, how they don't sing, how they rear their families, how they rear their children, how they handle their marriages. There's going to be somebody critical of what goes on. So Paul now tells us how to get along with one another. Now, I have taught a series, and I believe Brother Payne has, on how to treat different types of church people and all of that. But we're going to condense everything down to one little teeny tiny passage. And it's all found right here. And so Paul now is telling us how to get along. And you know, listen, you, no, no place is perfect. Somebody said the other day they didn't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, so is the grocery store. But you still go to the grocery store. So is the Walmart. There's a lot of hypocrites down at Walmart. Did you know there's hypocrites here in this nursing home? Yeah, they're everywhere. You know why? Because there's people. So somebody says, oh, I don't go to church. That place is full of hypocrites. Well, uh, let me just tell you this. He's right. There's a lot of hypocrites in church. So Paul's trying to help that. So now, uh, so what we want to do is this. Christians have their battles as well as their blessings. And Paul instructs us how to handle those who oppose us or, God forbid, those who oppose the word of God. Now, I know in every church there's somebody, one of these days, is going to rear their ugly head and they're going to confront the pastor or the Sunday school teacher or the pastor's wife over a huge disagreement in the Bible and they're going to get ugly about it. How are you supposed to handle that? Are we supposed to look at that individual and say, well, there's the door, don't get hit with it on the way out. Is that what we're supposed to do? Are we supposed to kick him as hard as we can in their backsides and, and tell them never to come back? Is that what we're supposed to do? Well, depending on their spirit, the answer to that, of course, is no. Notice with you, if you would please, the first thing the Bible says here in verse 14, he says, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. So we are to bless them and not curse them. Bless them, not curse them. Let me read you Matthew chapter 5, if I may. In verses 10, 11, and 12, Jesus said in his own words, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So when somebody <laughs> persecutes you for your faith, you bless them. Well, I don't like how you preach. You know, you could say, well, I don't like how you smell. You know, you could say all kinds of mean things back, but that's probably not a good thing to do. Listen, I don't like how I preach. <laughs> And I don't like everything I say either. I don't always agree with myself when I'm preaching. I'm thinking, why did I say that? That was really a mean thing to say. And I, you get after yourself. But when somebody else has to criticize us, suddenly we get on the defensive. Jesus said, or Paul wrote here, uh, the same words that Jesus said, you bless them and not curse them. Secondly, look if you what it says here in the next one. It says, um, uh, verse 14, verse 15, rejoice in with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind. We should never, ever, ever get in trouble with someone because of wrong living. You know, sometimes people have a reason to criticize you. It's because you're doing something wrong. 
People don't like to be told they're wrong. You know, you shouldn't use that language. You should not uh, be inappropriate in the way that you treat your daughter or your wife or your son uh, or your brother or your sister. And sometimes we need to be corrected because we don't do something that we ought to do or we do it wrongly. You know, you shouldn't have done that, brother. But we should not have a testimony that says folks can criticize us because of wrongdoing. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm not going to read all the verses because there's just so, so many, but it's 1 Peter 2 verses 11 through 25. The Lord says to us there in that chapter, if you're going to get in trouble, get in trouble over something that you do that's right. Don't get in trouble over doing something wrong. Daniel got in trouble for doing right. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got in trouble. Abednego got in trouble for doing what was right. John Mark got in trouble for doing what was wrong. The Apostle Paul got in trouble for doing what was right. If you're going to get in trouble, get in trouble for doing what is right, not doing what is wrong. And so, he, so that we got to have a strong testimony. And so sometimes within a local church, uh, there are those that need to be rebuked very, very strongly. I remember, I think I've told the story here a number of years ago, but I, I always talk about there are people that need to sit in the chairs or sit in a pew and not be in a place of leadership because they're not ready yet. They're not ready to lead. And I remember as I was on a bus route one morning in, um, in Illinois, I was a guest preacher at a church. They wanted me to come preach, and they wanted me to come sing and play my guitar and all the things. Had the whole program, pretty good-sized church. And I got on this bus, and I remember that as a little boy started to get on the bus, the bus driver opened up the door, and he said, and I can't say the words because he cursed, he said, where in the blank have you been? And I said to myself, that little boy just got cussed at. And that bus driver had no business driving that bus and picking up children. He wasn't ready. He needed to be corrected. That's not a matter of having a disagreement. The man was wrong. And I said it to the bus director later on, that man needs to be rebuked for the way that he spoke to a child. So the Bible teaches us, if you're going to get in trouble, get in trouble for doing something right not for something that you do that's wrong, you see. And uh, when look at what it says here in verse 15. We need to have sympathy on people. It says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Christians often are too busy being so full of themselves that when another Christian hurts, they often say, well, they deserve it. Well, they may deserve it, but that's not your business. Or they may be rejoicing and we often get jealous and say, I know how they live. How come God bless them and not me? Well, my advice to that is always go look in the mirror and you'll see exactly why God blessed them and not you with that sorry attitude you have. You know, it's hard sometimes for Christians to rejoice with those that rejoice because they're too busy wanting what other people have or weeping with those who weep because sometimes they're glad that they got in trouble. One day I visited a man in the hospital. He wasn't a member of our church, but he was my friend. And he got real delinquent, didn't go to church. He was just out of church forever. And here he is laying in a hospital on his back looking up. Some people are, have the idea that when you see somebody like that that's been disobedient to the Lord, you say, well, brother, God put you on your back, so the only place you can look is up. What's God teaching you? Uh, that's wrong. You don't ever do that to somebody in the hospital. They want somebody to feel sorry for them. I walked into this man's hospital room, and he looked up at me and said, I knew you were coming. <laughs> I thought, oh, great. He said, I knew you were coming. I said, really? He said, yep. He said, I should have known you'd, you'd show up when I got in the hospital. He said, I guess God's trying to teach me something, huh? That's what he said to me. I said, I don't know. I said, I came to pray with you, friend. I didn't come to judge you. I come to pray with you. I spent some time with him and prayed with him and left. Boy, was he shocked. I was trying to weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. When you do that, you end up with a good testimony. Many years ago, I had a young boy, had two teenagers in my youth group from a particular home. Their last name was Otterdahl. They were redheaded. And uh, the, the youngest one was named Mark. I believe his name was Mark. 
And Robin and I and the kids all went on a vacation. We got in the car and we were driving toward the Midwest and uh, we got as far as Indiana from Minnesota. And I got a phone call while I was there that said that one of my boys had gotten killed in an accident. It was, it was the young Otterdahl boy. He, was just, he just came into the youth group. And I thought, wow, that's tough. He was riding his bicycle and got hit by a truck. A 7-Up truck hit him in the back of his bike, flipped him up onto the curb, and his head came down and hit right here on the curb, killed him instantly. So I looked at Rob and I said, well, we got to go back. We can't keep going. We got to turn around and go back. We can take a vacation anytime. And so we, got in the, we spent the night there because it was late. We turned around, drove all the way back to Minnesota the next day. And I got there that evening, and I remember as I knocked on the door, and the door opened up, the mom answered the door. She was just in tears. She didn't know we were going to be there. And the oldest son said, see, Mom, I told you he would be back. Wow, that blessed my heart. They knew that I would come and weep with those who were weeping. That's what God says here we're supposed to do with people in the church. That's just, it's wonderful testimony. Something else, look at verse 16. We, not, we need to have humility. We heard a message yesterday on humility. Uh, it says in verse 16, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. He's saying we need to have humility with those who are around us. Nobody in this room likes talking to a proud individual. Nobody enjoys it. I don't. Can't stand it when a person's so full of themselves. Their favorite words are I, me, my, and mine. I did this. You know, you know what a good conversationalist is? It's someone with whom you can speak who doesn't always have a story to tell you while you're still talking. Did you know that? You say, oh man, I, you can't believe what happened to me the other day. A good listener says, really? Wow, that's amazing. And you know, um, the, the whole idea here is, do you think of someone, you go and you tell them, perhaps, maybe you're hurting, and you tell them a story of a heartache, and the first thing they tell you is what broke their heart. Or you tell them about a financial loss that you had, and without even saying, oh, I'm so sorry for what happened to you, my friend. Oh, I feel so badly. They say, oh, <laughs> you're not going to believe it. I lost more than that. They've always got a story to tell you back. I learned a number of years ago that if you're a good listener, you don't have stories to tell people. You don't have another illustration to give them. You don't bring something up out of your own life to tell them. That doesn't make them feel any better to know that they suffered loss. Misery doesn't always love company. Sometimes misery just wants to talk. Am I right? You know, so, oh, let me tell you what broke my heart. Well, let me tell you what broke my heart. Well, that's nothing. Let me tell you about what I lost. That's nothing. Let me tell you about this. You always have to one up. The Bible says we're to weep with those who weep. The Bible says here that we are to not be so full of ourselves that we're always talking about what happened to us. Talking about all the illustrations we've got to tell. A good listener is one who is able to humble himself. And by the way, God will never humble anyone. Every time the word humble is used in the Bible, it has to do with a person, well, in this sense, a person has to humble themselves before the Lord. And just sit and be a good listener. You say, when people talk to you, pastor, do you always have something that you could add? Are you kidding? I'm a preacher. I got a big mouth. I got lots of things I can add to a conversation. Do you? 95% of the time, I don't anymore. Because it's rude to always have to add to a story. Condescend to men of low estate. Let's go a little further, and I'll be done here in just a moment. Um, let's see here. We'll look at verse 19. The Christian is never to pay back the one who opposes him. Rather, he's to let God do it. Very quickly, and I'll be done in just a few moments. Verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it, is, for it is written, Revengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And that means that we need to let God repay, whether it's in this life or the next life, but it's not up to you to be God's instrument of judgment. 
Well, you don't understand what happened to me. I don't have to understand what happened to you. All I know is this, is that God is the one who, you know, payback comes in time. What goes around comes around. Give God a chance to do what God does rather than you being the one who does it. Next one is this. Look at verse 17. Provide all things honest in the sight of all men. It suggests that a Christian lives in a glass house and he has to be aware of what other people think about his testimony. You know, we're living in an age now where a lot of men in, in, the, in the pastorate say foolish things like this. Well, I don't care what anybody thinks. Well, that's stupid. You need to care what other people think. Now, you need to care what they think about your disposition, not necessarily your position, but about your disposition. And you know, a lot of people today have a, have a very poor testimony because they don't care what anybody else thinks. Well, you need to care what other people think. You're the living Jesus Christ to them. You are the testimony of the Lord. You are, you are the living letter of God. Be careful. You need to know if people are, you know, so I don't care what people think about how I look. Well, maybe you ought to go look in the mirror and see if you can change something that make it better. You know? Someone says, well, I don't care what people think about my education. <laughs> if, if there's areas you can improve, you need to improve. That's what I try to do. For 21 and a half years, I had a secretary that corrected my English in my sermon outlines and in all my letters. I've learned a lot in 21 and a half years. I was the speller. She was not. She was the grammar queen. I was not. I learned from her. I always was trying to improve. And now when I go back over things that I have written, I correct everything that I've made wrong because I learned. And those things are important. And you know, uh, I say that because I send a lot of stuff out on the internet, but the pain receives them. Um, I don't know, do you get them, Sarah? Uh, the outlines and things like that? Do you receive anything? I, my outlines go everywhere. I have a mailing list. It's not huge. It's over 200, but it's not huge. But you know what? People read those things. I got a sweet letter from a retired pastor two days ago, and all he wrote on there was, Dear Pastor, thank you. Thank you. And every one of the words that was in there was grammatically the way it ought to be. And he reads these. I read stuff from people, misspellings, mispronunciations, wrong words, um, uh, wrong punctuation. You say, you shouldn't be critical of that. No, but I do care what people think about what I write. They may not care about what they write, but I care about what I write. I text. Do, some of you text as well on your phone. Yeah, I text. You know what? I don't, do, I don't use texting language when I, when I text. U is Y-O-U, not the letter U. R is not the letter R. It's A-R-E. And uh, it's not, I, I use, I, use, I true do my very best. <laughs> of course, I usually mess up. But I do my very best to have proper punctuation, proper spelling, and complete words because I care what people read on my phone. I really honestly do. So, uh, people say, I'm going to live my own life. Well, according to the Bible, your life is a testimony of Jesus Christ. It better be good. And so, as we see, look at verse 18, and I'm going to be pulling this to a close here just in a moment. Uh, it says, live peaceably with all men. And of course, we cannot compromise with sin or have peace at any price, but people are watching us. And we need to do what we can to live peaceably with the people around us. You only have one chance to make a first impression. You never get a second chance. So, the Bible says uh, that we've read these. I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter, or Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21, refers to three verses in the Bible, three passages. Proverbs 25, 21 says, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. That's out of Proverbs. We just read that a moment ago in uh, the book of Romans. What does it mean to put coals of fire on someone's head? When I was growing up, I always thought that meant burn them up good, boy. Be kind to them, and you'll burn them good. Didn't mean that at all. I always thought it did. What it meant was, is when you are kind to someone who is unkind to you, they come to your home with an empty bowl 
needing fire because in their home the fire went out. And so they scoop hot coals of fire into that bowl and the person carried it back on their head as they did in Bible times. And it says, for when you feed them when they're hungry and you're kind to them when they're unkind to you, you are putting warmth back in their home by being kind to them. There are a lot of people who have left Timberline Baptist, not a lot, that's not true. There are a number of people who have left Timberline Baptist Church in not such a kind way. They left angry, they were critical, they caused a lot of damage. There's not a single one of them, not one, not one person in 24 years who can look at me and say that I treated them wrongly or I treated them ugly because we had a disagreement. And when I see them in public, I walk up to them, I shake their hands, I greet them, I ask them about their family members, I say, how are you doing? Because one of these days, I'm going to stand before God with my actions. I'll never stand before that person. I'll stand before God. The Bible says, to me belongeth vengeance. God will repay. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says that. And then the Bible says that vengeance belongs to God. That's Hebrews chapter 10. So we've got to let God do what we want to do, which is get even. So, when it comes to dealing with people within your own local church and your enemies, you're here, you are a soldier. Now, what is, what is the purpose of all this? That we may prove what? That is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The will of God is proven by the actions that we take with others. And isn't it funny? Now, maybe you've not seen this. I've, I've tried to make it clear, but I'm just not good at this. And I'm really not. Paul says, you dedicate your life to the Lord. You do it for holy, acceptable unto God, your reasonable service. And the reason you do that is that you might prove what the will of God is to other people. Then he tells us how to behave. Oh, why? So that we can prove the will of God to people. And he gives us instruction of how to do it. I said yesterday in one of my sessions, we preachers are good at telling you what to do, but not telling you how to do it. And the Apostle Paul gives us step-by-step instructions of how to prove the perfect will of God to people. 